Okay, if you guys know me and know me well, you know that one of the things that I take issue with that really bothers me, you know, gets under my skin, is the way the housing narrative kind of plays out. Now look at this headline. This is a perfect example of what I don't like to see. So it says, despite rate hikes, home prices ramp up. Well, that's a little bit misleading. So it's kind of like, yeah, we know uh, mortgage rates are rising, but home prices are ramping at the same time. A little bit of, uh, I guess, a conflict there, I think, right? Well, anyway, we're going to debunk that right now. We're going to get into it because we're talking about Case Shiller. We're talking about Case Shiller Home Price Index from January a couple months ago. And, of course, when we talk about rate hikes, we're talking about what's happened in the past couple of weeks right now. So big difference here. We're going to go through it right now. So welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate. Today is the 29th of March. The month is almost over. Fun is just beginning, guys. Let's get into it right now. So um, as I said, that's a misleading type of headline, which which for whatever reason I just think is doesn't do anybody any service. So yeah, we'll talk about case show in a second here, but the biggest talk for the past couple of weeks has been the increase in mortgage rates. So we're seeing a lot of economists, a lot of you know industry pundits, whatever, weighing in, and pretty much they're all coming to the same sort of conclusion, which is, hey, increasing rates will create a substantial downshift on home sales. So basically, it's kind of obvious. The increase in mortgage rates means things are going to cost you more, which means your buying power is down, which means you know you're compressing um, your, you know what can you what you can buy as far as a price point. So as a result, expectations would be that home prices should start to fall, so that people who want to sell can actually sell to people who actually um, are, want to buy based on the rate structure. All right, home prices soar at one of the fastest rates on record. But higher mortgage rates should uh, slow future growth. So we're just going to see article after article on this right now. So I guess from my perspective, it's actually a good thing because now we're putting some, as I said, some realism back in real estate as opposed to constant double digit month over month, year over year appreciation, which the market just, it just spins out of control. So there's no, you know, you know, a couple months ago, there's no stopping what's going to happen. Now we see some pretty drastic stops happening here. Uh, also, just to keep you informed, NARA National Association puts out on a monthly basis. I don't really talk about this too much because I don't think it's, you know, I mean, it's sort of obvious, right? It's their pending home sales index. So basically what they're saying now, so for, for uh, the month of February, uh, which reflects contracts that are signed, which would be future closings in, say, end of March, April, May, etc. So their index is down month to month 4.1%. They're basically saying, okay, obviously less home sales activity is going to happen. Uh, is it because of a lot of things? Yeah, it's probably because of some rates. Uh, going up, it's probably because of some inventory, probably a combination of a few things here. So obviously we see, you know, the West down 5.4%, Midwest 6%, the Northeast 1.9%, the South 4.4%. It all averages out to a down, um, you know, from the previous index, 4.1% month over month. So we're starting to see it in signed contracts, which is what pending home sales really is. Now, uh, this refer to, I refer to uh, WolfStreet.com. This is Wolf Richter's um I guess you say website. I do like what he puts out. I've never talked to him or, or, or met him, but um, I, I do like his spin on things. So we're going to refer to it here. And obviously, he's talking about the home uh, most splendid housing bubbles in America March update. Why? Because today is Tuesday, the 29th of March. It's the last Tuesday in the month, which basically means that's the day when the Case Shiller Home Price Index is released. So we're going to we'll hit that in a second here. Uh, basically, he's saying so now we have a new snapshot of the incredibly spiking home prices. Um, basically, um, you know, what time span are we talking about? And this is why it's so important. This is why I put this this article up because the January home price data released today are a three month moving average of closed sales that were entered into public records in November, December, and January, reflecting deals and mortgages that were agreed to roughly in October through December when the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate was about 3.2%. Now the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate is flirting with 5%, and today's home price data is still untouched by that um, spike in, in, in mortgage rates. So right now, you know, it's going to still take us two to three months to see how the, the rates that are happening right now reflect in today's contracts, future contracts, and then when we go two or three months ahead in time to look back at, you know, we'll, we'll talk Marches and Aprils, um, you know, uh, Case Shiller uh, Home Price Index to see what happened on on home price appreciation. So 
please keep that in mind. So it's a you know the real estate market's not easy to to say the least, and we have to just make sure we understand what's happening with the data we see and how it's portrayed. Thirty-year fixed mortgage rates, obviously, you can see a bit based on October December time frame, we're at three point two percent. Here we are, we're into March, so basically we've seen a significant spike in rates. Obviously, you know we all realize the Fed has gone on record saying that they're going to be raising their rates every couple of months. Expectations are we're going to have you know uh, seven or eight you know raises of of interest rate. Um, over the next you know 12 months, maybe 18 months or so. So yes, that's reflected in what's going on in the marketplace right now with respect to mortgage rates. So the hysteria of maybe December, November, December, January, um, you know, contracts or sales uh, really is based on people you know hearing that rates could go up and let's get deals done now before we're priced out of the market or we can't afford it based on our mortgage uh, availability here. So again, things are going up, they're going up quick. Um, something else that we don't really talk about too much here because I'm not an economist, but if anybody, you know, if you're, if you're listening to the news and you're listening to, you know, um, or, or reading the websites, whatever, you know that, you know, obviously we're flirting with high inflation, well not flirting, we have high inflation, double digit, digit inflation, we're flirting with the recession. Uh, some people say it's already here. We're entering into one, etc. The point, though, is that there are recession triggers or things that sort of give us insight as to when a recession is going to happen, where it started. One of those things is the yield curve. So basically, um, hard landing, virtually inevitable countdown to recession begins as the 210 curve inverts. So basically, um, you know, this is the 210 curve is the most monitored, most studied, and most accurate predictor of recession the market has to offer. And today, after a long wait, that actually happened. So the 210 curve did, did invert. And that is one more thing to put in our list of what's going to cause, you know, some economic down, downsizing, downshifting, chaos, and some housing market downshifting in the near future. So it's not just one thing that typically happens to bring housing down or to correct it. It's actually a, a number of things that could happen at once. So, again, keep that in mind. So, and by the way, this video is brought to you by our friends at foreclosure.com. I have an affiliate arrangement with foreclosure.com. If you'd like to see the distressed property listings in your neighborhood, your neck of the woods, go to gethousingdata.com. That's gethousingdata.com to check out what's happening with respect to distressed housing in your neighborhood. It, it can show you anywhere in the U.S., but, but particularly if you want to know how your market's being affected, go to gethousingdata.com. You can check that out. Now, as I mentioned, Case Schiller. So what do we got going on with Case Schiller? Well, guess what? So Case Schiller came out today, as I mentioned. It's, re it's reflecting the January data. All right, and I guess this is their press release. So Case Shelley releases a monthly press release with graphs and the whole bit, which you can download for free. It's quite easy to get. Uh, just go to their website. Basically, what happened? Well, um, I guess you could say uh, reported a 19.2% annual gain in January, up from 18.9% the previous month. Every, all the composite indexes came, uh, you know, double digit, almost 20% uh, gains here. Phoenix, Tampa, and Miami reported the highest year over year gains. So, um, you know, Phoenix, again, I don't know how many months, I think it's 40 plus months now, but Phoenix is always in the top spot. So um, that's kind of a scoop here. Sorry, things are moving quick here on my computer. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's quick. So basically, home price changes in January 2022 continued the strength we have observed for much of the prior year. Um, all three composites reflect the small acceleration of price growth for January. All right. Um, basically, um, Phoenix has led all cities for the 32nd consecutive month. Tampa breaks the 30% um, threshold in Miami at 28.1%. That's the silver and bronze positions, I guess they're saying. So ultimately, in the <coughs> excuse me, in the end, they're talking about the fact that declining COVID cases and a resumption of general economic activity has stoked inflation. The Fed Reserve has begun to increase interest rates in response. We may soon begin to see the impact of increasing mortgage rates on home prices. So even the case Shiller people are saying, you know, we're going to see some impact uh, based on these rates. Again, see how that all plays out. The whole key is how it all f comes in together. So obviously, here's, geez, sorry guys, it's like it's cl clicking twice here. Uh, basically, you know, you can take a look at, you know, the, the indices and how they're sort of going up with, you know, gain and losses, etc. So you can see that. We're, you know, the month over month gains are pretty much going on an exponential, like we've hit from, you know, three, four, you know, five percent up to double digits now. So that's certainly, you know, that's certainly a consistent increase in double digit gains. Uh, when we take a look at the overall over the years, we can see that the middle of the graph here, those three humps, that was our previous housing bubble in 2006. Obviously, the top right, right part of the graph is where uh, the three indices are going. We have a 10 city composite, a 20 city composite, and the national overall index. 
So you can see that basically the past, you know, from 2000 sort of 20 to where we are, 21, 22 now, it's pretty much gone on a, um, not a linear growth. I would call that an exponential growth. So basically everything's as high as it can possibly be. So that's no surprise. It's the same old story we talk about every month now. Where are we with respect to where it was in the last or previous housing crisis? So February, uh, sorry, July 2006 was the last peak. February 2012 was what we call the, the trough or the deepest part of the trough. So where today's peak is compared to the last peak of 2006, we are 52.7% greater than the last peak. And this is on the national level. Obviously, things are different on the uh, 10 and 20 city composite levels just based on you know, the makeup of the properties and where they're at. We are over 100% current from trough 110 percent i'm just talking the national level right now so think about that right if you bought a property probably in that sort of you know late 2011 early 2012 time frame you've doubled your money on it okay the, the current from current uh from trough is 110 percent so you've probably done well uh maybe it's time to sell maybe it's time to refi but that's you know the people who bought in that time frame um that's you know that was the right time for sure obviously almost 53 percent from the peak those are pretty significant numbers um, when you actually start taking a look at where we're at. So uh, is it going to keep going? Well, that's the whole point here. We'll, we'll figure that out in the next little while. So if we take a look at the summary for the top 20, we got Atlanta at 22.5%, Boston at 13.3%, Charlotte at 24.4%, Chicago at 125 Cleveland at 13.3%, Dallas at 27.3%, uh, Denver at 208 Detroit at 140 uh, Vegas at 26.2, and these are year-over-year -year change from January to January, all right? Uh, Miami, uh, number three position at 28.1, Minneapolis 11.8, New York 13.5, Phoenix, as I mentioned, the 32nd or 33 month uh, in the lead at 32.6, Portland 17.7, uh, San Diego 27.1, San Fran 20.9, Seattle 24.7, and Tampa, where I live in the second position, uh, for the annual year over year appreciation for January is 30.8%. So we can see that the lowest number we have here looks like Minneapolis at 11.8. So the lowest on the top 20 is a double digit. And, uh, you know, in, compared to uh, Tampa or Phoenix at 32.3. So pretty big range there. But the, the point is that none of these are 5% are or 2%. We're all double digit at a minimum here, uh, which really shows where the market has gone or come from and where it's going the whole point though is can i guess you could say will the um will interest rates drag this down will the upcoming amount of foreclosures pull this down as well too so that's we'll talk about that in one second here so that basically is kind of like this is the case shiller stuff so uh as i said it comes out every month it's kind of like the basis everybody looks at for home price values and home price appreciation but first of all if you're not a subscriber to my channel and you appreciate the information i provide if you could smash that subscribe button i'd really appreciate that and secondly if you are a subscriber please if you could just verify your subscription check it out see that make sure the notifications are on uh smash the subscribe button again because i do lose more subscribers than i put on i've been plateauing and maintaining the same level for i don't know how long now i just literally um, you know, uh, increased to over 27,000 subscriptions. So I do appreciate that. Uh, though everyone tells me I should be up a lot more. And yes, when you look at the stats, I should be way more, but that's the way this medium works sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> read between the lines, right? So please, please and thank you. I do appreciate your patronage and watching the videos here. So getting into the foreclosures now, this came out the other day, end of the week here from Adam Data Solutions. This is why, you know what, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and, uh, you know, I've been talking about the housing bubble and the foreclosures for, what, three years now? Pretty consistently. I've never deviated from my position on this or what I think is going to happen, etc. Have I been frustrated? Certainly have, along with everybody else here. Um, have we had market manipulation and certain things put into place to kind of choke our market and, and create maybe some uh, artificial values and uh, keeping certain, you know, lower priced property, you know, off the market? Yes, we have. But... It's coming back, guys, and this is the whole point. Now, I know everyone's impatient. Listen, I'm the most impatient out there. I want this to happen because it's when my, my, where my business flourishes uh, and the stuff that we do on the distressed property market here and across the country. So just to keep you guys informed, yeah, we're getting foreclosures. Yeah, we're getting foreclosure starts. And listen, um, here's the top 10 um, housing markets with respect to um, foreclosures, and I want to make sure that I think I mixed up the slides here. Um, so I'm going to go by state first. This is the... Um, 
actually, this is just the this is the front part. It's Adam Data Solutions. So basically, uh, essentially, February numbers jumped up big time. All right, which we know, and I know that we already talked about earlier, but I but it, it was actually nicely graphed out for us. That's why I wanted to revisit it. So basically, you know, we're going to go through the states that saw the greatest numbers. We're going to go through the metros and and the counties that that saw the greatest increases as well too. So now we're talking increase as opposed to losing, maintaining. So states that are increasing, take a look here. California, number one. Florida, this is for February, the greatest number of foreclosure starts. So a foreclosure start, for those of you that don't know, is actual the starting process. Uh, it's either a foreclosure filing, which in a judicial state is called a, you know, a Liz Pendens, which is notice of litigation, I guess, in Latin, or it's a notice of default. So what that basically means is that the lender is going to the homeowner saying, okay, you've not paid your mortgage for X number of you know, months or years. Now we're going to start our process of obtaining that property back from you unless you can cure the situation. So um, this, so these are starts, so starting the foreclosure process. So obviously uh, California leading the way, California the most populated state, Florida number two, Texas number three, which goes in hand with population and opportunity, Illinois number four, Ohio, um, Georgia, Michigan, New York, Indiana and New Jersey. So when I look at these, these are just the, like the states um, that we had situations with um, back in the last housing crisis. So when I look at all this, yep, nothing surprises me. And it, it to me, it's like okay, even you know California now leading the way, which shows that even though there's tons of equity in California, there are people who still are, are, are have foreclosure filings. If you think about this, you know the, the part of the narrative which I always talk about is everyone says, well. Geez, you know, if you've got all this equity because we are, what, record equity now, according to all the narratives and all the, you know, the, the people who are pulling the data, apparently, uh, on housing equity, why don't these people simply sell and walk away with money in their pocket, okay? Well, that's easier said than done, and there's reasons why maybe people can't do that, which I'm going to get into in a subsequent video, uh, because I think it's important. And when you actually, you know, kind of go through the reasons why, you go, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Basically, you know, where are you going to go, right? You sell, well, you got to buy your rent, and guess what? Can't you, you sell from a foreclosure position? You're not going to be able to get a mortgage. That so means you got to rent, and rents are skyrocketing now. So what are you going to do? So people just tend to hunker down, stay in their property, and milk it as long as they possibly can, not knowing what to do. And sometimes that actually hurts their position in the long run. So anyway, here we got, here we go. Just so you know, California leads the way. Florida and Texas, number two and three, which really is typical. And there's no surprises there. All right. Let's take a look at the next slide here. Uh, so once the states, we're going to go to counties. So uh, the number, the, the, this is the top 10 counties across the country for foreclosure starts. Cook County, Illinois. So obviously the Chicago area. Got L.A. County, clearly um, Los Angeles. Harris County, Texas. Harris County, Texas is the Houston metro area. Maricopa County, Arizona. That's in Phoenix. So, you know, funny enough, you know, when you take a look at even a, even a Phoenix who leads the um, Phoenix, who leads the country in home price appreciation based on 33 months of Case Shiller data, even Phoenix is seeing a significant increase in foreclosure filings. So that shows you that there's some disconnect between what is really going on in the marketplace, what we see as far as home price values, and the narrative that's happening out there. Okay, so just you know, let's always say keep that in mind. All right, Clark County, Nevada, that's Vegas, obviously. Suffolk County, New York, that's off of Long Island. Wayne County, Michigan, the Detroit area, Riverside County in California, just outside of LA there. Cuyahoga County, Ohio, that is the Cleveland area, and obviously San Bernardino, which is beside Riverside County. That San Bernardino, Riverside County is usually a pretty big apex for um, uh, pre-foreclosures and, and situ defaults going on here. So again, um, as I said, typical counties we saw before. Now we go down one layer more. We've done the state level. We've done the county level. Let's go to the, the actual metro level. So Chicago, Napierville, Elgin, Illinois, uh, obviously up there. Um, number two, New, New York, Newark, New Jersey. So yeah, when you have New York, all the boroughs, New Jersey, and Long Island there, um, you know, that's... That's a lot of pre-foreclosures uh, historically are still sitting there, and obviously the filings are going up. Great opportunity there. L.A., Long Beach, Anaheim area. Next, Houston, which is the Woodland, Sugar Land. That's sort of basically Harris County. Atlanta, Sandy Springs, Roswell, Georgia. Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm. Big, big area there. And what I mean by that is um, when you actually take a look at Miami-Dade, Broward County, which is Lauderdale, and, and Palm Beach County, which is West Palm, that whole I-95 Southeast Corridor is huge, hugely populated. Tons of, tons of 
things are going, uh, obviously we'll see an increase in foreclosure filings, but when you take a look at the foreclosure auctions, hundreds are going to auction every every month there now. Next is Detroit, Warren, Dearborn, Michigan, obviously that area, Philadelphia, Camden, Wilmington, Pennsylvania, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, so uh, out in Texas there. So you know, again, big cities, big city problems, and now we're seeing foreclosure filings. So this should come as no surprise to anybody who's been following this information over the past couple of years. As I've mentioned, we had a choking of the market with respect to foreclosure uh, moratoriums, eviction moratoriums, foreclosure starts not being filed, things that were in process being held up, and you know new filings, um, you know auctions being canceled, new filings just put on hold until things have opened up. Now we're fully into 2022. We're entering the second quarter of 2022, and we can see that now the lenders and their attorneys are ramping things up and they're moving forward. There's no more government protections, no more state protections uh, at all. Now it's time to face the situation. Uh, people who are in forbearance, they're coming out of their forbearance, forbearance plans, having to face their situations now too. So we're still going to hear a lot of rhetoric and, you know, we'll call it conflicting information about what's going on, but this is proof positive. that You can see that now things are starting to take place. They're not little increases. We're seeing big increases. I expect those to happen um, for quite some time now. As every month goes on, we're going to see a consistent flow of, of these pre-foreclosures and foreclosure starts. So that's what we do here. That's what we are looking forward to, etc. Reason being, two housing markets at play right now. As I always say, the retail market, which is tough and competitive and it's very expensive. And as we just talked about the foreclosures, that's the shadow inventory, the behind the scenes market. It's when the two converge or when you converge on that market is when you get lower price properties, better deals, um, and a little more inventory. So let's hope that some of that will manifest its way through. We're going to have to do a lot of work to get our hands on these things on a personal basis. Now, I've talked about this before to the rolling distress to statistics. Statistics are hard. Um, I do have some soft spot in my heart because I know for the data people because I know it's hard. And quite frankly, you know, I'm, I'm, people are calling me with these, you know, hey, check this property out. Well, you know, we're seeing foreclosures that were filed 10 years ago, six years ago, seven years ago that are dormant for whatever reasons. Uh, and this, they've not fallen off. They've just not gone forward. They've been quiet. Now they're getting restarted or refiled. So interesting how things are happening. So a lot of people who have been in their house, and listen, there are people who are still in their house from 2006 who have not paid their mortgage. Okay. So I've talked to a lady last week and that's, and I, she's the winner of the person that I've ever spoken with that's been in there that long. So since 2006, it's 2022. And she's still trying to finagle her way uh, to make money out of the deal, okay, believe it or not. So anyway, lots of forbearance coming, okay. Obviously, the numbers I thought were always underreported. Lots of delinquent loans not in any loss mitigation program, which means they have no, no solution for the foreclosure process, which means they're exposed. Those that are in a lot loss mitigation program are not paying. If you're in a loss mitigation program, typically you should be paying some sort of mortgage fee or, or, or negotiated loan fee to you know, amount to your lender. A lot of those people aren't, which means they're going to fall out. And we estimate uh, between three to 10 plus million foreclosures happening in the next little while. Um, that's the range of what we hear based on conservative to people who are in the know. I think we'll be right in the middle. I, I'm thinking 7.5 is a good number for me. So keep that in mind, which means that's opportunity for all of us to buy better homes, cheaper homes, and have some, you know, and just equity, basically, right? Uh, to, to, like, push that stuff down. So increase in unique situations. More deaths equal more estate, more probate, um, which means people who are dying who have mortgages. That's, good. That's, that's problematic for them and the family, but opportunity for future purchases. Homeowner association foreclosures, I mentioned. If you're down here in the Florida area or areas where you have a lot of HOAs or condo associations, uh, that process typically runs faster than a mortgage foreclosure. So there are people for various reasons who don't pay their HOA, and I think those are great opportunities because you can pay off the HOA and control the property and then f fix and finagle and figure out what to do with the loan balance if there's anything on there, which is what we like to do. More So more layering, multiple issues of these per deal we're going to see, make them tougher. Landlord fallout, we'll see lots of landlords who've had enough of the situation and basically maybe want to sell or just want to want to walk away because they don't want to deal with any future problems uh, with respect to, um, I guess you could say, you know, the eviction moratorium. Like, there are people, I, I talked to some other day, and you know, it's uh, certain parts of the country, there are people who have been in homes for 18 or, or in, in you know 18 months not paying and the landlord can't do a thing about it. So uh, very, very uh, difficult. And we know that the small investor, the mom and pa investors are the target 
Uh, that's because they have all those assets. That's the target for the hedge funds and the government right away there. We're going to see more unpaid property tax. I didn't, I didn't put a slide up on this, but um, I just read it before I started the video, is that you know what we're going to see now is since we have all this huge home price appreciation, what are all the counties and municipalities going to do? They're going to reassess everybody's values because now it gives them the opportunity to raise your property taxes, right? So <laughs> that's going to happen. So um, you're going to see maybe that might cause some people to go into unpaid property tax mode, which could cause uh, delinquencies, which could cause problems for people down the road. So just something to think about. Uh, a lot of these things are going to happen, and that's part of what, what's going on here. Do you want to talk to you about opportunities? Build to rent, build to flip, working on that right now. My Distress Deal Architect, available now, eight-week live training program. This is a perfect program for people who maybe think the short sale stuff I'm doing is a little too advanced or they don't really want to get into that right now. But this is going to give you a, a, you know, a broad, um, a very, very broad education and, and situation of learning uh, the, the opportunities that are in a number of, you know, I guess you distressed property niches out there. So something you want to check out. I'm going to start that in two weeks. So let me know. I'm taking names and get people to, uh, signed up on that right now. Again, my short sale program is kind of no more now, so they miss, if you missed the boat on that, sorry. Uh, it'll come back in a different format in the next little while. So this is what we got going on here, guys. It's a busy time of year. Yeah, here's the deal I keep showing you guys why, because this is a very successful deal. We saved this from a, uh, from a foreclosure sale, um, got the homeowner off the hook, um, settled the debt for them. Uh, the buyer, who's a client of mine, uh, purchased it, and now you know they've, they've got some pretty good equity. The equity is you know, bigger than it was when we did this in December, and uh, great opportunities to either fix and flip, make it a rental property, um, sell it retail, whatever you want to do. All right, so it just shows you that there are deals to be had if you look hard enough. So again, guys, thank you for the views, likes, comments. Uh, please share the video with your family and friends. If you want to talk to me, there's my email. Send me an email. Give me your telephone number. We'll engage, and we'll look forward to speaking with you in a couple of days. See ya.